everyone, welcome. We're waking up with watches today, and my goodness is this a milestone episode. The first broadcast from our new headquarters. I am now unconstrained by insurance carry limits, and I've brought the best of the best for this episode. Remember, everything you see here is for sale, and the direct service email pricing and purchase inquiry line is tmaso at thewatchbox.com. It's for you, to me and my crew, with your questions about everything you see here. Let's jump in with a heavy hitter. In fact, the heaviest of heavy hitters. Launched in 2013, this was the successor to absolutely nothing in the Lanka catalog. In fact, it was the response to the Patek Philippe 5204 that had bowed the previous year at Basel. So a first ever for the 1815 line. This is the 1815 Rattrapont Perpetual Calendar. You could see a split seconds chronograph for timing two concurrent events and a beautifully cruciform symmetrical dial made of sterling silver featuring the perpetual calendar as well as the moon face. Rose gold case, 41.9 millimeters. Don't let the aspect ratio fool you. It's not as big as it looks. It's actually quite compact, all things considered. Gold case, silver dial, sterling silver, and then you've got a solid gold moon phase disc. Now, the fun starts on the case back. I'll be totally honest, Longa is all about the movement. And here you can see the caliber L1011, manual wine, 631 parts. What's going to strike you here is the presence of two black polished column wheels, lateral clutch, note, fully jeweled, and there are many interior angles, many black polished components. And you can see the combination, let's bring that back in focus, the combination of the German silver elements, nickel, copper, zinc with that golden hue. It's the copper that gives them that golden hue. And then all of the silver elements are actually polished steel. You'll note satin for the chronograph levers. Let's quickly actuate the chronograph and enjoy the motion of the lateral clutch and the column wheel. Note the presence of the two column wheels operating this is as good as it gets. There is even a decoupler system at the center, so when the split second's hand is frozen, it does not create a dragging condition whereby the frozen hand is slowing the movement as a whole. Now let's quickly throw it on the wrist and take a quick look at how it appears. My wrist 16 centimeters circumference, you guys know it well. The watch on the wrist is far more reasonable in proportion than it appears when I hold it in space. Uh, absolutely disembodied from the wrist, you would think it was a 44. On the wrist, you could see it's not even quite a 42, meaning down to 15 centimeters circumference, you're gonna wear this one comfortably. Now, I promised you heavy hitters today, and we may as well go in sequence, or reverse sequence as it happens. Launched in 2012, this is the Patek Philippe 5204, but this is the 1R model. This came about in 2016, and it is a full bracelet rose gold repost to the Longa 1815 Retropomp Perpetual Calendar. As you can see, matte black dial, oops, let's get that back in focus there, matte black dial, rose gold hands, rose gold indices, and you have a combination of polished hands for the time of day and calendar, and then you have frosted rose gold, you'll note, for chronograph minutes as well as chronograph seconds. Now the timepiece features a full bracelet, and you'll note that Patek Philippe has engineered this bracelet, if we can look at the end link real quick, Patek Philippe has engineered this bracelet to expose the pushers that are used for the adjustment of the perpetual calendar. So you actually have these little apertures in the bracelet so you can make those adjustments while it is in situ. It's difficult to describe this bracelet if you're only familiar with the sports watches as it features a five link design that almost feels more like a Rolex Jubilee on the wrist than any of the Nautilus or Aquanaut bracelets. You can see it vents the wrist nicely. So if you do live in hotter climes, say Miami, and you wanna wear this 40.2 millimeters, that's 40.2 millimeter watch, Watch. in hot weather, you're not going to soil a strap with moisture, heat, sweat, and grit. Wear the bracelet. This is the natural match. A tropical watch with a tropical bracelet. And of course, the two perfect on my wrist and probably viable on a wrist as small as 14 centimeters circumference. We're going to flip this one over and forgive me here because the basic movement here is the CH29535, but with the bracelet, it's not quite as easy to expose. As you can see, it features an extravagant finish. We'll zoom out a little bit with black polished, satin finished, and of course, mirrored englage, Cote de Genève, and engine turned perlage components. This is really as good as it gets in the world of Patek. You can get more complicated watches, but you cannot find a finer timepiece, nor a better match for a smaller wrist if absolute complication density is your goal. We do have some Pateks on the table, however, that will challenge it, and I think it's important to quickly give voice to one of the great traditions in Plan Les Watt, which is the dress watch. In fact, for the millennium, 
Patek Philippe launched a revival of its 1950s manta ray case. This is the reference 5100, an extraordinary yellow gold Geneva Hallmark chronometer, 10-day power reserve, manual wind, and as you can see, the movement is both properly sized and shaped for the case with a traditional set of chiton fixed jewels for the two barrels and you can see a finger train style set of bridges leading down to the escapement now it is a chronometer and it is geneva hallmark so you're getting the highest level of finish but you've also got a high horology brand putting its money where its mouth is as oftentimes geneva hallmark watches and haute de gamme watches in general are not submitted to the rigors of the cosc test precisely because well it would be embarrassing if you failed a test that's routinely passed by tag hoyers Patek Philippe, again, went big rather than going home. So this is a chronometer and Geneva Hallmark, 34 millimeters from wing to wing from 9 to 3 o'clock. And you can see from lug to lug, approximately 45 millimeters. So this is actually a fairly compact watch. The fit of a non-round watch often can be highly particular, and I always say they tend to wear larger than their rated size. This one is true to size. 45 millimeters lug to lug, remember, is going to be about 5 millimeters less than a standard Rolex Submariner or Daytona with solid end links. So if you can wear those, you can wear this. Now, of course, this was a limited series. For the Millennium, 1,500 pieces in yellow gold. They don't surface too often, and as you can see, it is an exquisitely crafted dial. Let's see if we can get that back in focus right there. You can see that there's the power reserve, the small seconds, hours, and minutes, and then a combination of mid-century modern dart-style indices and an erect set of Arabic numerals in matching yellow gold. The dial has a little bit of a silver cream coloration that's delightfully off-white. And if you look at the watch in profile, you can see the nuanced angles and curves of the case, which is downright biomorphic and organic. As you can see, there is a tremendous fluidity to the sculptural form of this case, right down to the curvature of the cambered sapphire. There is a great deal of hand finishing involved in not just creating these components and fitting them together, but also ensuring that a watch like that passes water test resistance. So... We're sticking with Patek. Patek remains our theme. I showed you the remarkable Millennial Reference 5100, and now I'm showing you a watch that came out in 2015. And many folks have described this as the best Patek Philippe high complication of the 2010s. This is the 5370P, a split second black enamel dial platinum chronograph, and we'll see if we can get that in focus, guys. You could see that the timepiece, featuring a rare black enamel, white gold Breguet numeral dial, has another refinement you might not expect. Historically, black enamel on Patek watches was scarce if ever used because of the difficulty of avoiding undulations and orange peel on a black enamel surface, things that white enamel typically hides. But not only do we have that here with the white gold Breguet numerals, we also have a loomed dial. It is a loomed watch, and thus a full-service sports watch that you can see at night. Now, as you'll note, it is gracefully sculpted on the side as the case flank, focus on the case flank right there, the case flank is evacuated, featuring a hollow that terminates in four white gold cabochon. Though a platinum watch, it features these little polished domed cabochon at each end of the lug on both sides to add a measure of elegance. And you can see from the crown side, the coaxial pusher for the Ratropon system, as well as the Lawson-shaped platinum chronograph pushers. Now the watch, of course, is powered by an extraordinary movement. We saw the 29.535 a minute ago in the 5204, but here you get a good sense of it in the split second. You have that same pincer style bridge at center that you had on the 1815 retro pump perpetual and that is the mechanism that controls the split second let's keep that in focus that controls the split second hand we're gonna have to kill autofocus after this show autofocus must die i'm going to wind this one up and allow you to see it in its element in motion because they all feel like specimens in formaldehyde when they're not wound and actively operating. So let's fire things up right here and take a quick look at the action. I can tell you that on both the Longa and the Patek, the pusher action for both column wheels is world class. It's crisp, it's distinct, you feel it and you hear it. And of course, in addition to the split second functionality, which allows you to time two concurrent events, you can also operate it as a conventional chronograph, meaning it has a conventional start, stop, and reset. You also appreciate the fact, well, let's get real close again, we didn't really see the case back to maximum effect before, and now you see it. Incredibly handsome 
and downright bewitching. When you're talking about 496 parts, every single one of them manually finished, even where you can't see, that is the ultimate sign of integrity, particularly sparing no expense here. Now it's a high beat movement, 28.8, overcoil hairspring, six position adjustment. It features a 65 hour power reserve and hacking. So if you have any reservations about the overall refinement or feature content of Patek movements, have no such qualms about this watch. It is truly spectacular front and back. And again, like the 5204, this is the highest level of finish that Patek Philippe offers on its watches. If you look at the detailing of the dial, you can even see that the hands, the seconds hands for the chronograph, have been rolled on a tiny roller pin to create a curvature that traces the arc of the dial and the underside of the sapphire. And of course, there is an instantaneous jumper system for the chronograph minutes, a little paw and ratchet that you'll see right there in action. Throw it on the wrist, a truly special watch in that it's really not that thick. About 13 and a half millimeters thick, it actually feels like a thinner watch on the wrist. Nice and compact, low coupled, easily sliding underneath a dress cuff or a formal sleeve of any kind. This is probably my favorite Patek on the table, and spoiler alert, we've got a minute repeater. Now, before we jump straight to the heavy metal, well, that, I guess that was the heavy metal, so before we jump, jump straight to another piece of heavy metal, let's talk about accessible watches, because you guys often ask me about watches that do not cost a mint to own. Well, back in 2000, Michael Schumacher with Scuderia Ferrari was the champion, and to celebrate, Omega launched a speedy reduced racing dial, 4,000 pieces, 38 millimeters in stainless steel. You can see this is the Schumacher racing dial, a tribute to his millennial Formula One title. It has the historic staggered hash marks and orange graphics of the racing dial Omegas with a ghosted silver checkered flag as the dial base. Of course, we've got a Hesalite crystal, automatic winding. This is one of the speedy reduced. Pre-2006, they used Hesalite. You can see there's a lovely tachymeter scale that is satin finished rather than the conventional anodized aluminum insert generally seen on these. The case back features a simulacrum of Michael Schumacher's signature, and you can see Schumi ist Weltmeister for the year 2000. A truly special watch and a great way to get into Omega without bowing in supplitude to, or supplication I should say, to the Church of Moon Watches. This is a speedmaster for ground-bound aviators who will trade their wings for wheels and a very special watch in the history of Omega Speedmasters because People scarcely give these up. When they find them, they tend to keep them or they trade between collectors. So that is a rare opportunity. Let's show the case back one more time, Sean. Sean on the camera today. I always like to acknowledge my crew. He's doing a great job fighting that autofocus. You can see Schumacher's signature as well as the World Championship graphics on the reverse of this speedy reduced racing dial Schumi World Champion. Now, we're going to jump to another Omega here. If you do happen to pray at the altar of moon watches, here is a very special 50th anniversary Apollo 11 Speedmaster Professional Moon Watch. 42 millimeters in stainless steel. This is the Apollo 11 limited edition. 6,969 pieces in a combination of stainless steel and what's known as moonshine gold. The moonshine gold features a lush combination that is an alloy of one or two and yellow gold. So all the metals that comprise this bezel have the look of a faded vintage 14 carat. It is very special. There is a ceramic tachymeter scale, and if you look and you see the image of the first step onto the moon, that is actually a solid disk of gold, that sub-register, which has then been laser ablated to create the image of the famous first step. Now we have yet another reference to the famed first step on the case back. Once again, laser ablation is being used. We're gonna to try to get the best angle we can with respect to the light. This is new. The studio is in its trial run, so forgive us here, but this is as experimental as the Apollo program. You could see the first step, one giant leap from mankind, the image of the footprint on the moon dust, and that has been executed with laser reduction. You'll also appreciate the fact that there is an all new, or I should say partially new movement here. For the first time ever, we have the 3861, which is a silicon hairspring master chronometer coaxialized version of the Le Mania 1873 base in the standard moon watch. So while it still derives from the Le Mania caliber, it is a unique movement only found in this watch to date. A lot of first here, chronometer, coaxial, uh, master chronometer, I should mention, with silicon hairspring and custom shock protection not found on the standard moon watch. This watch has it all, right down to a bracelet that's designed to emulate the vintage 
circa 1968-1969 Apollo era Omega Speedmaster bracelets. And you can see there are several vintage Omega logos on this watch, as well as one on the clasp, which though a twin trigger system is designed to emulate a vintage look logo. Now I wanna draw your attention real quick back to the dial and some of the nuances. Not only do we have applique indices in real yellow gold here and the solid gold disc for the man on the moon, but we also have a lovely and subtle reference to Apollo 11's mission number. As you can see, numeral 11 above the index in yellow gold on the dial side. A very special watch in every regard and probably the best of the Omega Speedmaster special series for the 50th anniversary last year. Let's continue with accessible watches for a moment because I like the theme and we've got some great ones on the table. Let's talk a little bit about Zenith. Of course, alongside Jaeger Lecoult, this is often the brand we discuss as the underrated connoisseur's choice. What you're looking at here is a Chronomaster 410, so it is the triple calendar moon phase version of the El Primero. Now you can see the timepiece is substantial. Silver dial, applique indices, fully loomed. The 410 is a famous movement because it was used on the great Chronomasters of the 1990s and early 2000s, and a lot of folks regard those very highly, and this watch is in that is it is in that mode, in that paradigm. This is not of the LVMH takeover era. Obviously, LVMH has owned the company since 2000. We had the Terry Natoff period, and now we've had, we have what is, for better or worse, the era of Biver under him or under his influence. This is more of a Jean-Frédéric Dufour zenith. The watches made from approximately 2010 to 2015 were the Dufour Zeniths, and this is that, channeling the best of the 90s into a timepiece for the 2010s that will look just as good 20 and 30 years hence. I have some disputes with the DeFi styling and the open dials currently being used by Zenith. I have no objections to this watch, which is eternal in its proportioning, its detailing, and its appeal. And of course, we love Zenith for its movements and the El Primero Caliber 410 present and accounted for. As you can see, it is a column wheel lateral clutch, just as we saw on the Patek Philippe and the Zenith a moment ago, or I should say the Patek Philippe and the Langa a moment ago. You can see the column wheel, the levers, and the horns of the mechanism in action. It's truly a treat for the eyes and also for those actuating the column wheel for the fingers and the ears. This is a pleasurable watch to enjoy, visually exquisite, audible in operation, and of course, a tactile joy. Let's talk a little bit about watches built outside the bounds of Switzerland. We talked about Germany, let's talk about Japan. Grand Seiko. For 2015, it threw itself a 55, 55th birthday party, and this was the watch. The SBGJ 015 40 millimeters Zeratsu polished stainless steel, 200 piece limited edition. You can see the dial features the recurring emblem of the Grand Seiko brand, the Rampant Lion. And of course, this one, a high beat GMT operating at 36,000 vibrations per hour with a 55 hour power reserve and true dual time capability. Now, of course, we know about Zeratsu polish. It's a tin plate method executed on a Zalitz machine where Grand Seiko artisans hold the surface to be milled. To, to be polished directly against the spinning tin plate. The result is optically smooth, black polished or mirrored surfaces. And you can see here, those are interspersed with satin finish details for contrast. This is the 44 GS case, uh, legendary design that's a little bit of a polyhedron as it has almost an insectoid compound eye lug tip profile. Thrown it on the wrist, I should mention the watch Swimmable, no reservations, with 100 meter water resistance, automatic winding, a true all-arounder on a full bracelet, and easy to wear. The watch is less than 47 millimeters from lug to lug, so you're going to find this one where it's real easy on a small wrist. Put it on a strap, it's even easier still. A very special piece, because this being a commemorative edition and a great one, Grand Seiko collectors tend to snap these up, and this is the first example I've encountered in about 5,000 watch videos. So these are special, and these are scarce. I also want to call your attention to some of the features of the dial here which go above and beyond industry standards. You'll note that the Dauphine style hands are black polished on their tops and they're faceted on their flanks. The Lancet style seconds hand is fire blued steel and then each of the individual indices as well as the logo and the frame for the date are hand finished on diamond tipped milling tools. So those are hand finished, the case is hand finished, the movement is regulated manually and when serviced, it is serviced manually by Grand Seiko watchmakers. All of which makes this a very special watch and one of the few ways you can get into true handmade watches for under $10,000 US. Now we should also talk a little bit about value in the dress watch genre because everything I've shown you so far has been a sports watch or an all arounder. Well this was one of the quiet stars of 2019 in the Omega catalog, the Tracer 
stainless steel now approximately 39.5 millimeters stainless steel with a lovely linen style dial you can see how there are several different shades textures and tones in there it's almost like denim so if you can imagine the image of the jeans on your legs it is exactly like that like a denim jacket like a set of jeans like your favorite set of jeans because this one fits like a charm you can see on the wrist a rare manual wind execution of Omega's latest coaxials this is a tremendous low cut easy to cuff dress timepiece that offers tremendous value stainless steel so you don't have to pay the precious metal premium and a version of Omega's premium family of coaxials. Tri-level coaxial, the 8910, gives you 70 hours of power reserve, manual wind, twin barrels. It has all of the refinements you would wish for on a premium movement, including a feature you won't find on the Constellations, which are now caliber 8800. Those do not have the double barrels, the extended power reserve, or the independent stepping hour hand that allows you to travel seamlessly and even drive the date forward or backwards as you travel across the international date line, east or west. A very special watch. We'll throw it on the wrist one more time. Again, my wrist 16 centimeters in circumference. You can see this one really lays quite flush. Less than 11 millimeters thick. It's just about the thinnest Omega watch you're going to find find in this day and age. That is a special piece. That said, it is not my thinnest offering. May I propose to you a boutique exclusive, a 2012 SIHH launch, and one of the finest modern reverso references ever made. This is the Tribute to 1931, the Grand Reverso Tribute to 1931 White Gold. 46.5 millimeters lug to lug and only 7.6 millimeters thick and that in spite of the rotating chassis for the reverso case you can see engine turned perlage on the base of the chassis and on the reverse side still sheathed in the original packing sticker a blank canvas for your customization engraving lacquer enamel coat of arms flag family motto personal motto it's your choice the dial on this one is so much more interesting than the standard tribute to 1931 i can scarcely class them in the same degree of desirability as this dial has a lovely frosted granular sandpaper like surfacing all of the printing is blue and you see the blue oxidized broadsword style hands small seconds caliber 822 inside manual wind 45 hours and the watch being 27.5 millimeters wide and 46.5 lug to lug wears quite easily on a smaller wrist though it is dubbed grand reverso you could see it is quite reasonably sized compact short coupled cropped across the wrist in a way that makes it viable on a wrist as small as 13 and a half to 14 centimeters circumference you could see just how flat this watch is on the wrist as it's almost sitting lower than my cuff and lower than the hair on my wrist a very special watch that comes across as one of the all-time greats i should also mention one of the curious details of the dial you'll note there is no Giger or lecoult branding on this dial reverso as the model was originally requested by a traveling salesman of the brand Lecoult then subcontracted the design of the case to Jager, which in turn subcontracted the design to René Chaveau, Alfred René Chaveau, the designer, the French designer of the Reverso case, and it was first patented in France. Also, because the case was made by Wenger and the movement was made by Tavanas initially, Lecoult didn't put its name anywhere on the watch, as it was more of the commissioning agent early on than an actual manufacturer. A very special piece and a lovely window into the history of one of the great brands in the business. Now, speaking of great brands in the Valley du Jeu, a neighbor of Giger Lecoult, Blancpain, and when we speak of them, we speak of the 50 Fathoms. Inevitably, every discussion of that manufacturer comes down to its most famous model line. And here we have the 50 Fathoms Flyback Chronograph, 45 millimeters in stainless steel. This watch was launched back at Baselworld 2007, and the reference 5085 has not aged a day. You can see that lovely sapphire capped and fully loomed bezel. And I should mention that fully loomed bezel turns this thing into a absolute UFO by night. A wonderful combination gloss and satin dial. It is a flyback chronograph. There is a date. It's still 300 meters water resistant. And there is a soft iron inner cage a la Milgauss to shield the hairspring from magnetic fields. Now on the wrist, though it is a big watch at 45, I can still endorse it for a wrist as small as 14 and a half to 15 centimeters circumference because you can really see that the watch is short across the wrist. Although it's immense, not much of that is the case. Most of it is the dial 
and the bezel. So that's where this one spreads its wings. Across the wrist, it's nicely constrained and secure. And a feature I adore about these watches is that Blancpain did not cut corners. There are no spring bars here. The strap is secured by hex screws and bars. So this one stays resolutely fixed to your wrist. It will not be going for an unintentional ride. Inside, Frédéric Piguet automatic vertical clutch column wheel, five position adjusted, caliber 1185. A very, very special watch. And again, if you want a bit more complication than a standard 50 fathoms of Fords, but you want no compromise in ergonomics or diving depth, that is going to be the natural choice. That said, and this isn't our culminating Patek, but if you want a sports watch for all-around use, the 50 Fathoms is a bit aggressive. At 40.5 millimeters and 12.5 millimeters thick, the Patek Philippe 5981A is the way to go. A flyback chronograph with wonderful reset and restart option. You have the lovely granular gradient dial. It has a little bit of sandpaper texture and it fades from silver blue at its center to almost navy at its edge. White gold hands, white gold indices, and a mono counter. You have hours and minutes on the same scale to maintain the symmetry and the uncluttered handsome minimalism of the dial. The basic Genta design survives the conversion to a chrono, and you can see how the chronograph pushers have been integrated into the flanking wings of the original design. It's very clean and functional. Despite the through case fittings, the watch is still 120 meters water resistant. All of which is to say, if something like the 50 Fathoms is just too aggressive for you, or too difficult to fit under a cuff, this will give you almost all the real world water resistance, as 120 is far more than most of us need, but you can see that the discretion here, the profile on the wrist, the stack height above the wrist, everything. It reads entirely different. And let's be honest, this is an emotional hobby and premium brands often carry an emotional premium. Patek Philippe stands higher in the Pantheon, though Blancpain is in it. Patek Philippe is at the apex. Blancpain is in the mid ranks. This is a true Imperator's watch. This is a watch that stands below nothing, as even Richard Mule time pieces generally lack the pedigree that this one has. Patek Philippe, a complete manufacturer, makes the movement and it makes the case and the bracelet. All of that executed in-house. You can see the caliber, 55-hour automatic CH 28520, a flyback and automatic free sprung. This is a timepiece that compromises nothing in terms of finish or functionality. And I should also mention that this is a bit of a lost art Patek, as after 2011, they started fitting pin sleeves in the sizable links of the bracelet, and this one still features the screws. So featuring the Patek Philippe seal on the movement, as you can see the Patek Philippe seal, as well as the screws, I can pretty much pinpoint the production of this one between mid-year 2009 and 2012. So 2011, 2010, and half of 2009. So you have a very good sense just by looking at the features of when that watch was made. And again, 12.5 millimeters thick, that one's only 0.3 millimeters thicker than a Daytona, which is to say, if you can wear a Daytona under the cuff, you can wear that. But for some, only the original, there is no substitute. And the Daytona remains glorious. But this is, this is wake up with watches, and we don't like to show you standard versions of popular models. This is a Zenith El Primero powered reference 16520, 40 millimeters, and again, 12.2 millimeters thick. This is a universally wearable watch. I've seen it wear well on wrists as small as 13 centimeters circumference. Launched in 1988, this is the look that became the Daytona. Before that, it was considered small, ugly, undesirable, with manual wind models staying in cases into the early 90s. Not so here. This was a red-hot watch from the day it bowed back in 1988. Now, this is an A-series watch, so late 1990s, and in outstanding condition with a solid end link bracelet featuring the straight-through polish on the clasp. Thrown it on the wrist, though, you wouldn't be able to tell it apart from a 2015 Daytona from arm's length. The only change after that, of course, was the addition of the ceramic bezel, and, well, respect tradition, a lot of folks find the discontinued watch is always going to be the more desirable, especially given that Zenith could only make about 25,000 movements a year four chronographs during the 90s. That was split between Zenith's watches, the Rolex models, and of course all of the other customers for the El Primero chronograph caliber that Zenith had. So production of these was always constrained in a way the 116520 after 2000 never could be. These are rare, both because people don't like to sell them and because frankly they just did not make a lot of them. This is scarce in a way the in-house caliber couldn't be. That's not down to Rolex, that's down to Zenith. But still 100 meters, a chronometer, automatic winding, and the El Primero in a Rolex case is really a best of both worlds scenario. That said, not let's go with a different Rolex option here. Some folks want more of 
a dress watch from Rolex, but they don't want to go Cellini. It's a weak brand, and the water resistance is compromised. Plus, Rolex, for a lot of folks, means a bracelet. And for a lot of folks, the Rolex Datejust means a Jubilee bracelet. The Jubilee was launched in 1945 with the original Datejust, of course, because that was the Jubilee of Rolex, 40 years of the company, founded in 1905. So with the Jubilee from the beginning, it always seems just to pair the date just with that longtime companion. Now here you're looking at an extraordinary tuxedo dial, 116231 two-tone rose gold and stainless steel. You can see that sunburst center and then the matte black base for the hour track with applique rose gold indices. This is an extraordinary watch, a little giant. In 36 millimeters, don't underestimate its wrist presence. My wrist again, 16 centimeters circumference and I have absolutely no objections to wearing this on a wrist up to perhaps even 17, 18 centimeters, as that was the size of Winston Churchill's wrist. And of course, Churchill was the first Datejust customer. So this is a wonderful piece of Rolex historical tradition. Remember, the canon of Rolex is going to be the Oyster Perpetual, the Datejust, the Sub, the GMT, and the Daytona. And this one stands co-equal with those Titans. A truly special timepiece in an unusual combination of dial, bracelet, case, and bezel. If you want Rolex quality and prestige, but you don't want a generic watch that everyone else has, go with something like that. Its exclusivity is manifold and self-evident. No one will ever have that watch in your office. That said, sometimes only the exclusivity of a smaller brand will satisfy. And for that, we have Vacheron Constantin. We're not giving up the durability or the water resistance or even the bracelet, but we're going with a watch that helped to build Vacheron as we know it today. The second generation, 2004 to 2015 overseas chronograph. 42 millimeters in stainless steel with a titanium bezel and a lovely anthracite gray dial. This is the watch known as the Deep Stream. Now the Deep Stream was a nickname for the model during development. It's not official, but collectors still refer to it as such. White gold hands, white gold indices, a watch that's under 13 millimeters thick, incredibly. It looks thicker, but it's not. It features an extraordinarily well-finished and substantial bracelet. As you can see, the polished internal facets around the Maltese cross motif. You'll also appreciate the fact that the brace is fixed to the case using screws and bars. Like the 50 Fathoms, this one is secure. And like the 50 Fathoms chronograph we saw, this one is powered by a Frédéric Piguet 1185 vertical clutch column wheel, but with the addition of Vacheron's double-digit date module. 150 meters water resistant. You can see this watch, 42, sometimes described as 42.5, whereas easily on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist, it's not terrible broad across the wrist. It has a cushion case profile inspired by the 1977 Vacheron 222, and it sticks to that aesthetic heritage while elaborating upon it. That double digit date was a calling card of the first and second generation overseas chrono, and a lot of folks miss it on the third generation watch that's with us now. Now Vacheron really thought this out. As you can see, every individual link is removable on both sides of the bracelet, and that's so you can absolutely find the perfect sizing. No compromise was made in terms of cost or specification. And if you look at the case back, we'll turn it right side up, you can see the image of the Italian naval training vessel Americo Vespucci. Note the triple finish as you have a granular base relieved and polished sailing ship and waves. And then you have a satin sunburst around it radiating out from an imaginary center point. Heck, it's quadruple finished as there is a circular satin finish on the outside of the case back. And again, like the 50 Fathoms, soft iron inner cage, like a Milgauss, to endow this watch with substantial water resistance. And here is a feature you will not find on the third generation overseas. The ability to pull the bracelet straight down around a smaller wrist. So if you have any trouble fitting the third generation watch on your wrist, you deserve to give yourself a chance with this model because the bracelet doesn't flare and fight. It pulls straight down. There is no impediment to its motion. Let's say you like the idea of a full bracelet, but you want to go thin, and you want a watch that's thin but substantial. You don't want it to feel or look like a toy on the wrist. Well, the 2019 Octo Finissimo automatic stainless steel is for you from Bulgari, the iconic 2017 GPHG men's watch prize winner, but now in steel with a triple coating of gold, rhodium, and palladium to give it a shimmering, coruscating aesthetic. This is an absolutely spectacular, spellbinding, and breathtaking look that defies description as well as the camera's illustrative capabilities. You must see it in person. The way this watch reflects light with wavelengths emanating out of the palladium, the rhodium, and the flashed layer of gold 
Again, indescribable, but what a feeling, a treat for the eyes and a sensation for all senses on the wrist as it sits lower than any other watch on the table today. I measure it at 5.05 millimeters thick, making it a full tenth of a millimeter thinner than is claimed. 40 millimeters in diameter and 46 lug to lug, no problem wearing this on a small wrist. This is becoming an iconic watch, a legend in its own time. And Bulgari, of course, having bought Gerald Genta and Daniel Roth has created a fully integrated manufacturer that builds its own dials, its own clasps, its own movements, its own bracelets, and its own cases. And you can see the BVL-138 55-hour micro-rotor wound power reserve with a platinum micro-rotor entirely sized for this case at 36.6 millimeters. This is the sign of a true integrated manufacturer and, I dare say, a high horology manufacturer as it is only 2.23 millimeters thick and beautifully finished in every regard with no compromise whatsoever. And again, you can see that in terms of the finish as well as the specking of a platinum micro rotor instead of 22, 21, or 18 karat gold. Let's take a look at what else we've got on the table here because I always miss something and I want to make sure you guys get the full benefit today. One more time across the border to Glasuta, the folks from Saxony and the Glasuta Original Panamatic Lunar. 39.5 millimeters as my caliper measures it in stainless steel. This is a watch that features the glorious duplex swan's neck fine adjustment mechanism. Now you know it well from the panel inverse, but this actually debuted back in 2001 across a broad range of watches. Automatic winding with two freehand engraved half bridges and black polished duplex swan's neck. This is a very, very special movement and a very, very special watch. As you can see, hand decorated with a Glasuta style full three-quarter bridge and a three-quarter rotor, which is an uncommon sight on any watch, distinctive of its brand, and on the dial side, with the panorama date, distinctive of modern German watchmaking, with lovely applique indices surrounding the blued hands for the hours and the minutes. Love the moon phase. There is a quick set for the date, which is not universal on these geo watches. So that's a nice feature to have. There's also hacking seconds for setting precisely. And you can see on the wrist, quite comfortable, nicely stanced, plenty of side to side clearance. If you do have that smaller wrist, 13 and a half centimeters, 13 centimeters, your wrist is still gonna wear this one well. And in stainless steel, this is a daily driver. This is a tough watch. This is a versatile watch. This is a beautiful watch. And we speak about the exclusivity of smaller brands with Geo making somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000 watches a year over all model lines, including limited editions. That is a scarce watch, the likes of which you will not see on your buddy's wrist in the office. Now there is something reassuring about going with an Apex brand and an iconic model. And from Breguet, they don't come any more iconic than the famed 1950s pilot's watch named after the contract issued for its design, the Type 20. This is 39 millimeters, reference 3800, the BR Rose Gold Era Naval. Era Naval, of course, emulating the original no-date dial issued to the French military by the multiple contractors who built the Type 20, of which Breguet would become the best known and most enduring. Now, it is a flyback chronograph, so you have the ability to reset and restart just as you would have with the originals. It is based on the Le Mania 1315 automatic flyback chronograph, so the pedigree of that particular movement is unimpeachable. Because the early examples of these featured tritium dials, and this is one such, it features a lovely, true tritium fade on top of the blue base surrounded by the rose gold 39 millimeters with bi-directional aviator style bezel you can see the watch is also 100 meters water resistant and thus a full service sports watch this would actually look at home on a nato throw it on the wrist the 39 millimeter watch wears easily as it is very narrow at just over 45 millimeters lug to lug any wrist can accommodate and this is a timepiece for the ages though not grand complication though not display case back Though perhaps not one of the it models of our time, this is an all-timer whose appeal transcends any given niche, any given fad, and any given era. This will look just as handsome and just as cool in the year 2055 when we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Type 20 contract. And because the correct number of watches in your collection is always N plus one, why not double up with Breguet? Now this is the 7137BA, 39 millimeters yellow gold. This is more of a traditional dress style Breguet in the mode of the design 
fashioned by Daniel Roque during the 1970s and 80s when Verguet was owned by the Chaumet brothers. The dial is made of solid gold, turned on a rose lathe, and you can see multiple finishes. You can see a billowing radial finish underneath the power reserve. You can see that there is a sunburst finish using macro rayon inside the date down at six o'clock and then you can see that there are satin finishes for the age of the moon as well as the hours register with the double engraving of the Breguet secret signature up at 12 and fired steel blued Breguet hands at the center. It is a thin watch at 8.7 millimeters thick and it is a handsome case back. This is the caliber 502 based on a Frederic Piguet P71, a high horology three quarter style rotor and note not just hand finish but there is a guilloche rose lathe turned Grand Doge or barley corn pattern on the rotor itself. No expense spared. Take no prisoners dress watch design. And again, 39 millimeters and less than nine millimeters thick. This one sits flat, flush, and gorgeous on the wrist, easily sliding under a dress cuff. You can see the height above the wrist is quite nicely constrained. This is a very handsome piece and one of the best buys in modern precious metal high horology dress watches. Breguet is a challenging brand to sell new. I'm not gonna lie there, but as a pre-owned buy, they do not come any more appealing. Now, I promised you a crescendo, a cataclysmic conclusion, a clash of titans. And well, frankly, I would have given you a clash of titans, but I don't have anything on the table that is the equal of this Patek Philippe 5078G. Black lacquer dial, and of course, 38 millimeters. This is a timepiece that is the best of everything. Roman numerals, black lacquer, white gold, and of course, a sensational, minute repeating caliber, the R27 Petite Second, micro rotor automatic, 43 to 48 hour power reserve. Note the black polished strikers. This is as good as it gets, and fortunately, being a Patek Philippe minute repeater, it also sounds as good as it gets. I'm gonna fire this one up. This is a model originally launched back in 2005, and the black dial version, pardon me, this is a platinum model. This is the 5078P. The black dial version that you see right here, debuted in 2008. So let me do my best to set this to 1259. Then we're gonna throw it right up against the microphone and let this platinum beauty speak for itself. Yes, 12.59, nailed it. Guys, if you want to see a platinum split, a platinum minute repeater, or any of these watches on your wrist, email tmasso at thewatchbox.com. My buddy Brandon is right here. He and I are minding the line. Thanks so much. Time out, Tim out. Prices are in the description below with names and references, and thanks for logging on.